Hello and welcome to the next episode of the official Property Entrepreneur podcast. Hope you are very well and enjoying a great week. It is Tuesday, it's time for your next episode. And in this podcast, I'm going to talk about why private schools. So many of you will have seen on Facebook and Instagram, if you don't already follow me on Instagram, it's Property Entrepreneur underscore and Facebook Dan Hill. You have seen me posting about private schools that we've been buying and lots of people have inquired as to why private schools what's the interest how does the strategy work what's the appeal so i thought what i'd do is i'll just do a quick 10 minute overview give you an introduction to it and then if it's of interest let me know drop me a message on social media and we'll do a bit more detail to give you a bit more insight i hope you have had a chance to listen to the last episode we did, two episodes ago, I think it was, called The 10 Layers of Wealth. So again, had lots of various comments, questions, emails into the office around 10 layers of wealth and specifically the financial fortress. And what we're actually going to do is I'm looking at at the moment in probably starting in March, doing a small uh, mentorship, small group, take about 12 people through over maybe seven or eight weeks the process that's required to put together your financial fortress. Now, this is literally 20 years worth of work. I've been teaching it for 10 years on the board level, and it's the whole strategy and structure that I've used to build my portfolio, to create wealth, to manage wealth, to diversify risk. And it's basically a dashboard. There's about seven or eight sections to it. And once you've built it out, it just makes your strategy, your decision-making process, your rules and your returns, black and white, really clear. And whether it's one year, five year, 10 year plan you're looking at, it'll have it in there start to finish. Now, it's going to be quite a small group. It will only be for high net worth individuals. Unless you're already making about £100,000 a year, this is probably not uh, suitable for you. It is a very much an advanced thing. If you're interested in that, drop me an initial Im- uh, message on Instagram or Facebook. And then when the details come out, we'll send it over to you and see if it might be for you. So moving on to today's podcast, talking about private schools. So what is the appeal of private schools? So I started looking at private schools about six to nine months ago and recently completed on our first one we exchanged in december we completed in january and we have our second one due to complete on the uh, last working day of this month so what is what's the appeal well to start from the top i get presented with loads of opportunities lots of deals lots of businesses to buy sell invest in and as many of you will be aware i'm a reasonably sort of conservative investor i don't do hugely high risk deals anymore Um, I don't do a lot of deals I might get involved in maybe five different deals uh, businesses outside of my existing sort of portfolio stuff uh, each year but when I find one that meets my criteria I absolutely uh, go for it because the explicit thing I'm looking for there's no shortage of opportunities you know you don't have to look very far whether it's in property or business there's opportunities everywhere. But what I'm really looking for is those needle in the haystack niches. So if you look at all of our businesses that were built over the last 20 years, all the businesses that I've invested in, angel investor in, incubators, companies that I currently own or the ones that I've sold in the past, they've all been highly niche businesses. Like very, very niche, very strategic, very well positioned, very crest of a wave normally. And there's something very unique about them. Now, When you find these businesses, they're highly lucrative, they're very well positioned, low competition, high margins, so many reasons why you'd want to do them, but they're not everywhere. You know, you won't, the reality of finding 20, 30, 40% margin businesses is reasonably slim. The reality of finding highly lucrative property deals or development deals in a competitive market is quite low. But when you understand how to use a niche and you find that little sweet spot that nobody else really understands, that's where it all comes together. And this is one of those. I was presented, this is one of the ideas or one of the opportunities I was pitched last year. Um, do, would you be interested in buying private schools? Initially, I was like, need to understand what the model is, but it's, you know, the, my initial thought is I can see why there's a an appeal in there. And then after a period of about three to six months, getting into the detail, understanding the market, looking at some deals, it's one that I've decided to go ahead with. Uh, it's worth acknowledging in this, 
Uh, this is definitely one of those opportunities where you need uh, a business partner and my business partner in this who bought the opportunity to me is a chap named David Allison. He is heading up the private school group. He is running the operations of the uh, schools and companies and he's bringing the education sector expertise to the party. He's got a lifelong experience in uh, running schools, being a headmaster, building schools, opening schools, launching and building portfolios of schools, buying and selling uh, overseas and presented this opportunity to me. He's done it uh, for decades and has seen an opportunity to now do it in the UK. The market timing's correct. The niche and the crest of the wave positioning is perfect and a combination of his expertise in the sector and my uh, expertise in uh, investment put those together and it bodes for hopefully a very lucrative and very well structured partnership opportunity so how does it actually work you know what is the appeal why does it make this a needle in a haystack business well the basic structure uh, and the strategy is the, the structure, if you like, is, in fact, now I'll talk about the strategy first, sort of the avatar, like what is this sweet spot that we're looking for? Well, there's no shortage of people interested in private schools. It's a big fund-backed, established asset class uh, profile of stock. You know, there's lots of funds, lots of national and international groups that build schools, buy schools, run portfolios of schools. But as with everything, there's a certain point which... Uh, it's like similar to development. Small developers like me will operate in that sort of one to 10 million pound uh, sweet spot, whereas the big developers wouldn't look at anything that's less than maybe 15, 20, 30 million, million pounds. It's knowing where those spots are. And most of the big funds, the big groups, the pension-backed PLCs that invest in these things tend to go for the bigger deals. So maybe three, five million pound uh, upwards, and that's the sort of space they play in in the UK and overseas. So the little niche that we're, we're operating is the smaller one. Um, we're not looking at groups at this stage. We're just looking at independence. And what we're looking for is um, independently owned private schools that are well-established, so long-standing track record, normally owner operators. So they've owned the business or the school for 20, 30, 40 years, the quite often the story is that he's the headmaster, she's the secretary, or she's the headmaster, and or she's the owner and her daughter's the, the headmaster. There's normally some sort of legacy piece there, husband husband and wife, uh, husband and son, husband and, uh, sorry, uh, father, and, father and son, husband and wife, some sort of legacy um, piece to do with the, the ownership. And what tends to happen is they've run it for forever. So, you know, it's, it's really well established, trades on reputation. And because of its credibility, it does quite well. Equally, it's probably due to the ownership being decades rather than days. It's probably quite, um, there's probably opportunities to, in, to improve it. So things like social media, uh, sponsored ad clicks, paper clicks, more active digital marketing. Equally behind the scenes, you know, if it was run on um a more uh, traditional style of operation, so maybe paper files and manual bookkeeping. There might be behind the scenes an opportunity to increase uh, some of those things. But because it's been there a long time, it's worked re reasonably well. But it's, they're getting to a point now where they really want to sell. And because they want to sell, uh, because, sorry, because they there is a sort of uh, emotional buy-in, because they've run it for 10, 20 years, 30 years, in most cases, uh, their children went to the school and they've now got older, maybe even had children of their own, their grandkids are at the school, maybe they're going to retire and they're moving around the corner. Lots of reasons why they've got an emotional attachment to the building, or to the, sorry, to the school. So for that reason, they don't want to sell it to a developer because they're going to move around the corner. They don't want to evict all the kids. They've got a legacy piece there. They want to see it go on to the next level and they don't want to sell it to somebody who's going to knock it down and put 50 houses on it, on the football pitch. Equally, because it's quite small and it's an independent, and perhaps it's not, um, uh, and it's an independent, it may not, and it, 
uh, or it might be small, it might not be of interest to the fans because it's perhaps as not optimised or as lucrative as it could be. It may be not be something that's uh, of interest to a normal small sort of armchair or retail investor who's just looking for a return of capital because it's a very niche industry and sector. There's not many people going out and, and buying and running these schools because they're, you know, they're very labour intensive. You have to really understand operationally how to run them. You don't, you couldn't just move out of a retail background or an investing background or a business background and then go in to start running a school because it's an education piece. It's a very specialised sector. So what it means is they don't have a, a huge amount of options to to sell. If not even that, um, not even that if they discounted it, they wouldn't be able to sell it because what they're looking for is somebody to take it on. So it's a very very niche part of the market. There's a very clear avatar of the people that we're working with and we're a very specialist type of buyer whereby, because at the minute, obviously, commercial finance is not fantastic. If these schools are quite old, you've got Propco, you've got Opco, perhaps you've got high overheads but limited margins in the operations. The finance opportunities and commercial rates at the minute are just, whilst buy to let and retail rates are coming down, uh, that commercial space is still real, real heavy on, you know, it's not uncommon for them to be getting into digital, double digits now, which can make it difficult for a leverage purchase. So we're in a re pretty unique position. We've got David who knows how to run schools. He's done it for his whole life. He's got experience doing it in the UK and overseas. You've got me who's got access to capital, looking to buy low yielding, low risk return stock. And it just makes a, a lot of sense. So what we do here is, we have been buying these schools off of the outgoing sellers. And what we're looking for is a genuine, it only works if there's a genuine sort of win, win, win. So what we're looking for is a win for the seller. Like the seller wants to keep the school open. They want to see it go on to the next level and they want to keep that legacy piece going. And they will obviously want a, a private and confidential sale. We can tick all of those boxes, whereas very few people would be in a position to. A win for the buyer. So obviously, because we are a niche buyer, there's not a huge amount of other opportunities. The prices that we're acquiring these are significantly more discounted than they would be if you were to value them on either EBITDA or the commercial valuation of the building or the bricks and mortar price of the land and estate. We're buying them significantly discounted on that. And it's a win for the school and the pupils because we're going in there with both the intention to retain operation as a school, but also optimize it. So bring things in like um, streamlined and efficiencies behind the scenes, making the customer experience better for uh, the parents, making the experience within the school by investing in the school better for the pupils, bringing in higher student numbers, moving it higher towards its uh, operational uh, potential or its operational capacity which brings in more operational and overhead budget which means we can invest more in xyz whatever we choose to 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 take the school forward whether that's in the grounds in the buildings or it's more uh, support and um sort of team resourcing by way of teachers expertise experiences within the within the school so that's the sort of position in the market and what we're what we're working with and if you're not already following me on social media Go on there, you'll see it shared on my stories, things like that. You'll see the schools, the buildings. These are real sort of trophy piece acquisitions. So the first one we completed on was uh, 7,500 square foot detached building on three acres of land. It's got private woodland, gated estate, football pitch, swimming pool, tennis courts, outbuildings, um, uh, forest, uh, school, music centre, etc., etc. It's, it's an amazing, amazing uh, amazing sites. So you can see those on my uh, on my social media. And what we're doing sort of strategically is purchasing the building and I'm basically buying it cash. So buying them uh, unencumbered because finance opportunities aren't fantastic at the minute. So buying them cash, which obviously means you can move a bit faster as well. Uh, and then what I'm doing is I'm putting we're putting the building in Propco. So I uh, own the building in Propco, moving the uh, assets, the trading assets, the IP, the operations into Opco. So you have two limited companies, Propco and Opco, and then putting a lease between Propco and Opco. So a 10-year lease. And then the appeal, obviously, for Propco is you've got a, bit, a business there that's established for 10, 20, 30 years, and it's got a 10-year lease on an asset. So for me, for my financial fortress, parking my pension fund in a, 
a state that I'm buying that's significantly below market value. So on the balance sheet, you're already acquiring 100, 200, 500,000 pounds worth of equity on the balance sheet, which isn't realized today. But obviously, whenever you choose to exit, there's a until then, there's a notional equity there that you can either leverage up against or you can just have sitting on your balance sheet. So that's the win for, for step one. Step two is then a guaranteed yield. So for the asset layer, so layer three, if you've not already listened to the financial fortress or when we talk about the 10 layers of wealth that I talked about previously, when you're getting up to that top layer of uh, asset, you've got the asset, which is below market value, real estate, real nice prime properties, and then you're leasing it onto a 10-year lease with the Opco, which gives you a stronger lease, a strong, stronger return than you would on most other low-risk, low-return uh, investments. That's a FRI index-linked uh, 10-year lease, which is a really attractive position to be in. And then third, you've got Opco, which is an operating trading company, which you may or may not have paid uh, a huge amount for. And that would then generate 10, 20, 30,000 pound a month in operational profits, which is the sort of uh, the third appeal or fourth appeal. And then the final one is if you choose to roll it up, there's a good multiplier. Although these sites are too small to be of interest to the funds, you you do a roll up, which is what we did with Multilet UK, rolled up 10 different businesses and then exited it to a larger one. Would be exactly the same with the schools. Take the opcos, roll them up, and then probably sell the opcos to... Uh, a fund or to a a larger investment group and then keep the prop go as either a pension fund things like that and you can use there's other advanced models here where you can use things like sasses and stuff like that to to make it more lucrative or to 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 leverage it up and roll up the returns so there's a few phases to this so we're as with anything we'll sort of have a strategy we've got a short medium and long-term strategy immediate plan is to complete on the first two schools which will be done by the end of this month and then get those bedded in make sure operationally everything looks in real terms as good as it looks on paper obviously we're in, into it for several million pounds so don't want to run before we can walk bed that in phase one proof of concept assuming that works we'd then move up to five schools and then what we'll be looking at there is a uh, an opco valuation of around 10 million so looking to roll up a group of individual pr private schools five schools each doing x amount in in profit look at the opco model then with five operation five propcos five opcos in a in a small privately owned uh, group structure and then finally would be a uh, uh, phase three would either be an exit to then exit to the to a fund or if there was additional economies of scale if the market positioning was still attractive and lucrative might be to, to scale up add more and just look at is it is it time then to scale or is it time then at, at phase three to uh, to sell hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into the appeal of them so they're really great properties really great uh, assets and estates to own um, in the future, if there were, if it did need to be a plan B, I mean, one of the reasons that we're able to do these deals is our primary objective is absolutely not only to keep the schools going, but also to take them to the next level. But should there ever be a problem economically or locally, for whatever reason, they're great assets to hold, they're great potential development opportunities as a second uh, strategy, but that's not why we're getting into it. You've got the Propco and Opco arrangement where you can get your balance sheet value up, you can get a solid yield on your uh, low risk, low return asset investment. You've then got your Opco and then you've got a potential multiplier up, roll up um, for uh, for a potential uh, exit in a, in a phase three. Hopefully that makes sense and gives you a bit of insight. If you want to know more about the model, the margins, the returns, the buildings, the sites, how we go about it, what what infrastructure we're looking at putting in place operationally how we're taking the schools and the pupils and the uh, experience and the education to the next level just drop me a note in the direct messaging on social media and on instagram or facebook and we will i'll put together a, a bigger podcast for that maybe get uh david on and we'll do a bit of a q a and answer some of your questions on that a few top tips with any as with anything with this the first thing is that you really do want to be looking for niche strategies. You know, there's so many, every idea and every opportunity is not a good idea and is not a good opportunity. What you're looking for is successful people say no to most things. Very successful people say no to almost everything. 
and you want to just be finding that real needle in a haystack, that one thing that nobody else is doing, where you can you can tick a few bit boxes that other people can't, like this, and it's just an absolute no-brainer. Making money is the last problem you need to have. All businesses are noisy, challenging, dealing with finance, brokers, solicitors, et cetera, et cetera. It's always going to be hard work, but you want to make sure you're doing it for something that is always going to, going to turn a solid uh, return. The second is make sure you've got the expertise that you need. So either you're well read on it yourself, practiced a decade in, uh, decades, not days of knowing what you're doing, or you're partnering with someone who's got those, you know, who's bringing that wisdom to the table. You can't teach experience. And if you're partnering with somebody that's got 20, 30, 40 years experience in an industry, that really is worth its weight in gold. And a strategy like this, you just wouldn't, there's no way I would do it on my own. There's no, the idea of me running private schools is a, is destined for failure. So what I'm not necessarily saying is go and do private schools. What I'm saying is take the logic and the fundamentals of this strategy of finding these niches, creating a partnership opportunity and then capitalizing, but don't play games you don't understand. Even if you see loads of people making money at it, it would just will not work for you. I don't know anybody else who this strategy could work with work for unless you had a high net worth individual with lot with resources that they're willing to park for low risk low return investment and a somebody in that field of expertise in this case education who's got experience in both running schools and being a headmaster and buying and building and opening and uh, launching schools in this country and overseas you want to find that partnership in what you're doing whatever it is consultancy based professional services certain investment strategies high density development pbsa you know find your niche find your strategy find the thing that you're you're the best in the business at and then you know or, or somebody else is the best in the business at and then put yourselves together and you're onto a, an absolute winner and then finally and this is something that I've tuned into recently, last sort of six to 12 months. I've, I've said it for a long time, but when we're talking about deals and strategies, it's very easy to get deal heat. Um, and the final top tip is just generally about deals is don't get caught up in the excitement. Don't get caught up in the deal heat and don't feel like you have to be doing, don't feel like the ego needs to be 20 deals a year. You're better off to do one deal every two years that makes you five million pounds than you are running around trying to buy a property a week and the mantra really is don't do deals that don't make money. The amount of deals that I see and I look at and that I don't buy because they just don't make money is is the difference between creating genuine, long-term, sustainable and, and scalable wealth and just being a busy fool running around buying deals for the sake of it just to put stuff on Facebook. So number three is just don't do deals that don't make money. That's the fundamental rule of investing. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, like I say, if you didn't listen to 10 Layers of Wealth, go check that podcast out. It seems to have gone down really, really well. Um, that is why we buy private schools. If you want to hear more, drop me a message on social media. Otherwise, I will catch you uh, on the next episode. And all the best until then.